It's, it's doing, but he's not loud. Free me free from the burden of sin, there's fire in the blood, fire in the blood. Would your people the victory win? There's wonderful fire in the blood. There is fire, there is fire, wonder working fire. Father, we're just so grateful for that. And Father, we 
uh, we as Christians, Father, I just pray this morning that you just give us a boldness to go out and, uh, and like in your word, compel people to come to your house, uh, Father, to, to hear the gospel message in hopes that they might receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Father, this morning, I, I can't help but think of what's going on in Ukraine and and the people there, the citizens of Ukraine, and what they're going through and what they're experiencing. But Father, we just pray that you just intervene, that you keep them safe, that you guide them to what they need to be doing. Father, just make yourself present. Give them a peace, knowing that you're in control. Father, for the ones that's on our prayer list this morning, the ones in the hospital, the ones that have been in the hospital, and uh, Father, we just put them in your hands. Father, that's all we know to do, because in your hands is the safest place anybody can be. Father, we know that you created us, therefore you know everything about us, and, and when something's wrong, Father, we know that you know the cure. Father, we just pray if it's in your will that you just do a miraculous healing. And Father, it's like I pray each and every week. It's not, not for anything but to bring honor and glory to you, point people to you. Father, we, we've had a couple of deaths in our extended church family. And Father, we just pray uh, that those people will, uh, that those families will re just feel your love. Feel your comfort and peace during this time. Father, put people in their past to love on them. To be your hands and feet. Father, as we continue our worship service this morning, I pray that you uh, just work through our musicians, uh, through, through Brother Tom as he leads our music this morning. Everybody that has a part, Father, I just pray that, that everything that's said, everything that's done, would just bring honor and glory to you. Father, I just pray that you prepare our hearts right now, that you fill this place with your Holy Spirit, that every mind, every heart, and every soul will be focused on worshiping you and on the message that you have for us this morning. Father, all this I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we continue our worship, stand with me. Amen. I hear the Savior say, My strength is need is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all and all. Jesus made it all. All to him I close. Sin has left the crimson throat. He watched it wide and slow. Lord, now in need I find. Thy power and mine alone can take the rector's son and fill the heart of soul. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson saint. He watched it white as snow, and when before the throne I stand in Him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all. Oh, to him I owe. Sin has left the friend.
stains and stain He washed it white as snow going to be sharing some scripture with us this morning. I'm going to tell you, I love that when I ask our youth to, to be a part of the service that they just are so willing to do anything that, that I ask. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life 
his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Excuse me, son. Yeah. What have you got here? Got got some birds, some wild birds. Really? Yeah. Where'd you get them? Out in the field over there. There's a field with wild birds. Huh. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind my asking, what are you gonna do with them? I don't play games with them. Games? Yeah, I just play games with wild birds. Yeah. What kind of games? Um, sometimes I like to poke a stick in there, you know, and they'll be like, one, cow, cow, cow. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes I like to rattle up the cage, and they think it's an earthquake, and they love that. <laughs> what happens to them after you're done playing games with them? Mm, usually I've been with my cat. Yeah, my cat likes wild birds. Uh, I tell you what, I am fond of wild birds. You are? Yeah, let me buy them from you. You want to buy my wild birds? Yeah. Well, they're no good for nothing. They can't do no tricks or nothing. And when you open this gate, they're just going to fly away. How much? You're serious? I'm very serious. Five dollars. All right. Ten dollars. <laughs> okay. Twenty dollars. They're wild birds. They're exotic birds. You found them in a field. An exotic field. All right. That's all I got. in there. Mankind. Found them in the garden. Funny thing is, they put themselves in that cage. I had nothing to do with it. So what's your plans with them? I'm going to play games with them. Games? What kind of games? All kinds of games. I'm going to put games into their life that they think is going to bring them so much pleasure. I'm going to turn the world upside down. I'm going to make right seem wrong and wrong seem right. And then? They'll be damned for all eternity. My father. I'm very fond of mankind. I know. We want them to have access to us. So, I'm going to pay for their freedom. You want these humans? Yeah. You know they promised you everything before. They're going to turn their backs on you. Some will, and some won't. You're serious. Oh, I'm very serious. It'll cost you your tears. I know. Your blood. Yeah. It'll cost you your life. I know. You're willing to give your life. I'm willing to give what it takes. This reminds us about what Jesus did for us on the cross. He picked up that wooden cross and carried it to Mount Calvary because he loved you and me. Oh, 
yesterday. Raise your hand and keep them up. Evan, you weren't here. And you're not a woman. Eli, you're not a woman either. Okay, so yesterday, keep them up because I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to call somebody out here in just a minute. Yesterday we had a mind here. Keep your hand up, Vicki. We had a mind here yesterday and she did a wonderful job of sharing uh, through song and through motion. So I'm going to call one of you up to do that this morning. Before John, put your hands up. <laughs> See, all these hands go down, don't they? I'm just kidding. <laughs> we we got to laugh at times, don't we? And I'm having technical difficulties this morning. John 3, verse 16. Y'all read it with me. For God For so loved, loved the world that, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should, should not perish, but have, have his everlasting life. Father, we just come to you today. Father, as we open your words, Father, I pray that your word will speak truth into our hearts and to our souls this morning. Father, I pray that your word will penetrate hearts and minds this morning and lives will be changed here at Tabernacle Baptist Church. Father, you have us all here for a special reason and a special purpose this morning. Father, and I just pray that when the invitation time comes, that you will give us the boldness to respond to what you are calling us to do this morning. Father, all this I ask in our Lord and Savior's name. Amen. So this morning we will uh, bring this Power of Love series to an end. Uh, as I told you last week, you know, we started out, we talk, we've been talking about the four different types of love. And, and I told you right at the beginning, I, I started with what I thought the hardest one would be. And, and I still believe it was the hardest one because you have to be careful in the way that you word things. And... And that was one book in, and the other book in is the greatest love or the ultimate love, and that's agape love is what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, agape love, you've got to understand what it's characterized by, okay? How many of you, before I say another word, how many of you think that you 
exemplify agape love on a daily basis. Okay? This is what it's characterized by. Sacrifice. It's characterized by inconvenience. In other words, to show this love, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to give up time with your family, with your friends, with other things that you want to do. With discomfort. It's a suffering type of love. All to benefit someone else. And just like I've said week in and week out, not seeking anything in return. This type of love is a dirty love. This is where you're going to, to get dirty and it's going to get messy because people's going to come to you and they're going to come to you with their problems and you're going to be there. And you're going to sacrifice that time and you're going to sacrifice the inconveniences all to benefit them, to lift them up. <coughs> I love the way first uh, Paul in writing to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians, what he says about love. And <coughs> he's, he, he's talking about this agape love. He says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It rejoices. Uh, it does not rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in truth. And bears all things. And believe all things. Hopes all things, endures all things. And then it says, love never fails. Now I want you to think about that, especially with what's going on in our world today. Love never fails. Ukraine is being invaded, and I'm sure people are scared and they don't know which way to turn. But you know what? Love never fails. Love is going to win. If you go back to World War II and and um, Hitler and the Jews being rounded up and executed. Love never fails. Love never fails. What I just read you is a perfect definition of agape love. And I found an interesting fact while I was studying. Agape agape is one of the rarest words in the Greek language. It's very rare. But interestingly enough, it is one of the most common words used in the New Testament. Now you think about that. It's so rare in the Greek language, they don't use it, but in the New Testament, it is used over and over and over again, and it's a very common word. So what do we got to do to really comprehend this type of love and so we can exemplify this love? Because as Christians, that's what we need to be, right? If we think of agape love, we can think of one person, and that's the person of Jesus Christ, and he exemplified agape love, right? So to really, truly understand what's going on here with this agape love, we've got to go back to the very beginning. We've got to go back to Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve, why were they created? Why were they created? For fellowship with God. God wanted to have fellowship with Adam and Eve. And guess what? He gave them free will. He gave them that option to have fellowship with him. Why did he do that? How many of you want a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife that you make them love you. Nobody's raising their hands. Because that's not love, is it? You want that love to come freely, right? Because it means more. And we know that Adam and Eve ultimately sinned and broke God's heart and they lost their fellowship with God. But you know what they didn't lose? 
God's love. Because if you read your Bible, we see how much God loved them. Because in the very, almost the very next verse of when they fell, when they messed up and they were hiding from God, God had a plan, didn't he? He had this plan, and we see in Genesis chapter 3, if you study that, we see the first mention of the gospel. We see Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is this agape love, and we see it from the beginning of Genesis, and we can see it, all, trace it all the way through God's Word. We're going to fast forward to where we're at in Genesis chapter 3. We see Jesus here, and he's talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was, he was a very learned man when it comes to religion. And Nicodemus, we know the story. He went to Jesus at night and was asking all these questions. And Jesus starts to lay out this plan that God had to show God's love to each and every person. Now, this love wasn't just any type of love. It was agape love. It was immense love. And we see right from the beginning... If what we read this morning in John 3.16, we see that he loved the world, right? How many of you think that it says, for God loved the world in John 3.16? There's a word before that. So. So. And I didn't do that. I didn't do that to make you feel bad, but that so right there is important. Because we can love somebody, but if we so love somebody, it's totally different. That so, it shows intensity. Do you love your husband? Do you love your wife with intensity? As a Christian, I hope that you do. But it shows intensity. It shows the extent of God's love. And we cannot measure that. And it shows the greatness of God's love. This love is a passionate love. What do I mean by passionate? What is a passionate love? What is a passionate love? It, it seeks you out, right? Yesterday at, during the women's conference, uh, a lady was talking and she shared a, a, a slide that she had put forth and it said that he calls you, when he Jesus calls you young people, Older people, when he calls you, he calls you by name. He says, Annette, come to me. Right? He says, Michelle, come to me. He don't just say, hey, y'all, come on. He loves you so much, he knows you. And he calls you by name to come to him. Now, I want you to think about this type of love because it is beyond anything that we can comprehend. You, do you agree with that? God's love is beyond our comprehension. We, we, can, we can comprehend just a little bit of it, but we can't comprehend all of it. The next word we see is loved here. And this, this word is the uh, verb form of agape, and, and we've talked over and over and over in the youth that when I've taught, and, and by now you should know what type of word love is and what type of word is love. I see a lot of this, but I don't hear anything. A verb, thank you, Frankie. <laughs> it's a verb. That means it's an action. It means sacrificing voluntarily. When's the last time you sacrificed to benefit somebody? Knowing all the while that it will mess up your plans for the day. It will mess up your plans probably for the weekend. <clears throat> it will bring discomfort to you. And it could even bring death to you. Are you willing to love like that? Hey. hey, 
just let, let them cry. That is a beautiful sound in the congregation here at Tabernacle Baptist Church. That is something we have missed so, so much. So let's stop here and look back at, at Adam and Eve. So what happened for their sins? Now listen to what I say. What happened for their sins to be covered? Their sins weren't taken away yet. They were just covered. So what had to happen? Something had to die, didn't it? An animal had to die. God killed an animal and covered Adam and Eve. Now I want you to think about that. Because that right there tells us how costly sin is. So if we, if we fast forward a little bit into the book of Exodus, what do we see? We see this sacrifice, this animal, God is, is laying it out. God is saying, okay, here is the way that you sacrifice. And what does he, what does he spell out? A perfect lamb. Spotless, without blemish. Do you not think that in, in Exodus that God knew what was going on and he was pointing to the future, pointing to Jesus in the New Testament, pointing to Jesus on the cross? That's exactly what's going on in the book of Exodus. He is pointing to Jesus. Now we see God is loving this way and he's sacrificing something. Who is God loving like this? I hope you still have your Bibles because if you look there, it says the world. Right? The world. Note that the Bible says the world is talking about the whole world. Now listen to you. The Bible doesn't say the whole world except for Democrats. It doesn't say the whole, don't laugh. It don't say the whole world except for Republicans. It don't say the whole world except for thieves or addicts or alcoholics or prostitutes. It don't say the whole world except for homosexuals. It don't say the whole world except for this group or that group or, or whatever else. It says the whole world. God loves the whole world. So what we need to do as Christians, love the whole world. I can't tell you at the times that in, in, I mean, very recently, people tell me that they're not welcome in church, that people say, you're, you're not welcome here. You've got to go somewhere else. In church, I'm just going to tell you right now, if that happens here, whoever tells somebody that, we're going to have a talk. Because you're not living a Christian life. You're not exemplifying Christ. I'll share a, a, a question I was asked on my ordination council. <coughs> and I've asked a couple on councils that I've been on. I said, would you welcome a homosexual into the church? And I said, absolutely I would. But there's two parts to that because... It means, to me, it's what do you mean by welcoming them into the church? If it's welcoming them into the doors of the church to come and sit down in these pews and hear the gospel message, you're absolutely right. And I will find anybody that, that thinks different. <coughs> because if you do not welcome them, if you're standing there and you know that person is a homosexual or a drug addict or whatever the situation is, and you tell them they're not welcome in this church. You know what you're doing, church? You are condemning them to hell. We need to open our arms, open our hearts, and say, hey, come in and sit with me. Now, welcome them into the church as far as being a member of the church. No, not until they do what we all have to do. We have to repent. We've got to turn to God 
and our lives have to be radically changed, and then, yes, they can be a member of the church. But there's two different things there. This church should be full each and every week with people looking for Jesus. Listen, if Jesus says that the world says the world that God loves, why do we try to divide ourselves? Christians try to divide ourselves. You look at all the denominations out that we've got out here. We're dividing ourselves. You look, this is not a multi-ethnic congregation, but it should be. We divide ourselves on so many things, and when we divide ourselves on so many things, you know what that brings? That brings hatred. That brings contempt. And we don't need that because God loves the whole world. The next thing that we see, if you look, is that he, and this he is God, because Jesus is talking, he says, God gave. This is an action, isn't it? This is the sacrificing part that God is doing. God gave something. He gave a sacrifice. God is giving something very costly, very inconvenient for him. Very precious and costly. And he's given this gift to the whole world if they would only accept it. Right? If I, if I had a gift up here, and I should have done that earlier, but if I said a gift here, and I said, Sandra, I've got you a gift up here, and put it right there, and you walk out the door, and never take it. It won't do you any good. Will it? That's what Jesus has done. That's what God has done. God has put, put a gift right here for each and every one of you. And all you have to do is come accept it. It's that simple. Christianity isn't some big complicated thing with lists that you got to do and, and don't have to do and all this stuff. All you got to do is say, God, I need... Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life. That's all. That's all. And when you truly do that, your life will be radically changed. So we see this, this gift that God has given, and, and we see that it is His only begotten Son. And of course, this is Jesus. This is a precious gift. All these babies are precious gifts, aren't they? I told Gina uh, after that video just a minute ago, she said, wow, that was powerful. I had one even more powerful that I used to share with the youth, and it was of a, a train operator, a train, uh, not a conductor, but not the engineer. He was over the making sure everything, the bridges and all this stuff. And his son had gotten trapped on the bridge. And this train was coming, and it, it shows the gospel message. It, it was 15 minutes long, and I would have loved to have shown it. You're talking about powerful and gut-wrenching. But that's what Jesus did, or God did. He saw that his son was <coughs> under the bridge, and he, he lowered the bridge to save all of those people. You think about that. Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus and to us all that the Son of God is the most precious gift. Now that phrase emphasizes that God's Son, and we're talking about Jesus, He's a one of a kind. There's no, there, there won't be another one like Him. And He's going to be the sacrifice. How, how was Jesus a one of a kind? First, He was born to a virgin. Can't happen, but God made it happen. He was born to a virgin to become a human. He was fully human and fully God, and he lived a sinless life to become what? The ultimate sacrifice, that perfect lamb that we talked about in, in Exodus, all for 
One reason to be sacrificed by dying on the cross for our sin and raising on the third day to go to prepare a place for us. So he loved the whole world so much and, and God did and he gave Jesus and we know that Jesus was sacrificed on a cross and then the next phrase and I love this phrase so much that whosoever I love that so much uh, Michelle had a shirt on yesterday that I, I used to make a lot of t-shirts and it just simply says I'm a whosoever and it's got John 3 16 that's the best witness in two. I can't tell you I, I've walked around with that shirt and people say, me too. Me too. Or I am too. I, I'm a whosoever. I, I've heard a, a woman call out across a store, I'm a whosoever too. But you think about somebody that don't know and you got that on and they say, what does that mean, whosoever? Would you, be, would you be willing to talk to them and tell them whosoever? But I want you to think about that whosoever. Number one, and most importantly, that means on an individual level. That means I'm a whosoever by myself. Right? You're a whosoever. If Jesus is truly the Lord of your life, you're a whosoever but it also is collectively. All of us together as Christians, we are whosoever's. This word shows who this love letter is written to. You know what I'm talking about when I say this love letter? I'm talking about this huge love letter because every page in this Bible, God's word is a love letter to each and every one of us. Notice this, whosoever doesn't exclude, does it? Just like I was talking about earlier in the, talking about the world, whosoever doesn't exclude, it means to anyone, no matter what you have done in your life. The only one that it excludes is those who exclude themselves by not accepting that gift that's on the table. Let me tell you, yesterday, and I'm going to, I'm going back because I'm going to tell you, I was ready to preach at five o'clock last night. I was, I was thoroughly exhausted, but I was ready to preach last night. But some of the stories that we heard yesterday of things that people have been through, things that people have done, God still says, I love you. And come to me. It don't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't. Jesus can take him and remove that. So how do you accept this free gift? I, I told Sandra I got a gift for her and she walks out and forgets it or just says I don't want it. That's one thing. But how do you accept it? How do you accept it? The Bible says to believe in Him. Now, I want to tell you about this belief. This belief of Jesus is not a head knowledge. We, we've got so many people fleeing church today, and I've shared this stat with you. Billy Graham says 80% of church members are not saved and are going to hell. And I think the number is probably higher today than it was when Billy Graham said that. You know why? Because they have the head knowledge. They don't have the heart knowledge. They don't have the relationship, that one-on-one -on -one relationship that can change your life. And that can only come from a repentant heart that leads to that relationship with Jesus Christ. This relationship will radically change your life. Line. It will change the people that you want to hang out with. It's going to change the things that you want to do. It's going to change your desires. It's going to change everything about your life. 
So why did God love like this? Why did he love like this? So no one would perish in hell for eternity. You know, the thing is, it says that you will have everlasting life. And the truth of it is, every one of us is going to have everlasting life. The question is, where are you going to spend it? In heaven or in hell? I want to spend, and I'm going to spend, my everlasting life, my eternity in heaven with Jesus. And I hope and pray that he gives me a better voice than I have down here so I can sing and worship him properly. <laughs> but you know, it's sad when we live in a society. And, and I'm, I'm going to say it. I love the internet. I love technology. But technology is of the devil. It's sad when we have boys and girls Men and women who strike up a conversation with someone on social media accounts and in the course of only a few days they fall in love with somebody. Brandy, I, I, I get it, but it's true. I mean, I've read story after story after story of people falling in love and, and, you know, they're so infatuated and everything, they will run away from home and get on a bus and go across the country to meet this person, never having seen them, never knowing what they look like. Because let me tell you, I can get on social media, I can set up a social media account today, and I can put a picture of a, a good-looking man with a six-pack abs and all this, and I can talk to you, and, and that's who you think you're talking to. And if I tell you I want you to meet me, and when you get there and you meet me and you see the real me, that's a problem. Then. But we, we, we have this, and they're so in love, and, and they're going to do anything to be with that person. Believing that they are real. Why is that a problem, church? Because here, here it is. When we, when we talk to people about Jesus, they say, that ain't true. I don't want to hear about that. But this internet love that they supposedly think that they have is all too real to them. But Jesus is a million miles away. So what do we have to do? As Christians, we to combat that. Each and every one of you as a Christian has a story. You need to tell that story. I think I talked about this last week just a little bit. Because I can tell your children, your grandchildren, my story. And it might help, it might not. But mom and dad's story to that child, grandma's story to that grandchild, uh, aunt, uncle telling their niece or nephew their story of what Jesus has done in their life that has a much greater impact. And to show the love of God through that story. Turn to that's where we've got to get to. That's where we must get to because the time is drawing nigh when Jesus is going to return. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we don't know the hour, we don't know the day, but guess what? With each day, we're one day closer. We're one day closer. How many of you want to show and exemplify agape love? I hope each and every one of you do because that's something that we have to do. We have to sacrifice to do this. We've got to deal with the uncomfortableness of doing this. I'm just going to ask you all about your head and hand. If I'm going to end up, y'all would come to start cleaning something solid.
you wouldn't just bow your heads this morning before we sing our invitation hymn. I told you all earlier that God has put you here for a reason this morning, each and every one of you. And he's done this for a reason because he wanted you to experience this worship service. He wanted you to worship him. But he also put you here to hear this message this morning. He wanted you to hear this message that, that he is giving to you this morning and uh, he's calling you to do something. He's calling you to respond in so many different ways. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus this morning, I, it's my prayer that you will have the boldness to walk this aisle. And listen, if you've been a member of the church for for 20, 30, 40 years and, and you realize this morning that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, don't be afraid to walk down. Nobody's going to laugh at you. Nobody's going to, to do anything but rejoice that you come to that realization that you need that relationship with Jesus. If you haven't been loving like you should, whether it's agape or any of the loves that we talked about, I would just ask that you just get up and walk down and get down on this aisle, or get down on this altar and pray this morning. Get things right with God so you can love like Jesus loved. If you need to come for, for any other reason, if you need to... Uh, you think God's leading you to join Tabernacle Baptist Church... Come down, we'll, we'll help you with that. If you need me to pray for you, I will be here. Father, this is your invitation. Father, I just pray for boldness for each person that you're dealing with this morning. And Father, there's no doubt in my mind that you're dealing with us. I just pray that you will give us the boldness and the obedience to do what you're calling us to do this morning. Father, all that's I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?